So when, when we look at uh, actuarial modeling tasks, so just a few examples where predictive modeling, where building risk models is, is coming into play. Well, then, first of all, you can think about uh, the example of, of pricing an insurance product, right? So pricing an insurance product um, that relies a lot on, on predictive modeling techniques. Why is that? Because in an insurance uh, business context, we say that the uh, insurance, we, we say that the production cycle is inverted. And what that means is that in an insurance context, you need to price the product before you know the actual cost of this product that you're offering. And in this case, you're offering an insurance coverage, right, over a spe specified period of time. So you offer the policyholder the, the promise uh, that you will take care of his or her financial losses under certain conditions uh, and under certain contract uh, specifications over a fixed period of time. And you need to price this product uh, before you can actually observe huh, what's going to happen over the insured period for this particular policyholder. So that's what we mean with this inverted production cycle of the insurance business. And it also means that you're going to use historical data and that you're going to use modeling techniques, random variables, predictive models, in order to determine this price based on what you learned in the past for similar risk profiles, for similar uh, insurance uh, products, right? And if you look at the, the technical building blocks of such, of such a tariff, of such an insurance uh, pricing model, then there are two, especially in the non-life uh, uh, insurance business, there are two essential uh, building blocks. And these are the, the frequency of events and the severity of events uh, on the other hand. So on the one hand, the frequency, on the other hand, the severity. And that has to do with uh, what matters. Huh? If you look at the, uh, at the period of insurance, what matters is how often is, gonna, is something going to happen. That's frequency. And if it happens, how bad does it get? So what will be the size of the, of the claim, of the loss that comes with uh, the events that, that happen? So that's visualized here in order to set what we call a technical premium, uh, a pure premium or a risk premium are synonyms. In order to determine a technical premium, we're going to estimate the expected number of claims for this particular policyholder on this particular insurance period uh, and for this particular insurance product. We're going to estimate the expected number of claims and we're going to multiply that with the expected claim size. Yeah? So we need predictive models for both frequency as well as uh, the severity of events. That's what I mean with this uh, visual. So that also motivates why during this course, which I really consider as a foundation course, we're really going to build up uh, skills about working with the distribution of uh, count random variables, right? So count random variables, frequency random variables, we need to be able to have uh, a good knowledge uh, of which type of distributions do I typically use for modeling the frequency of events? Which type of distributions am I going to use to model the, the, the sizes of, of claims, right? So that's what I mean over here. Then a second uh, key actuarial task is uh, the reserving. So we're going to discuss that in, in full detail in the non-life insurance uh, course. But what reserving is about, it's about setting aside enough capital to be able to fulfill our future liabilities as an insurance company towards our policyholders. Yeah? And you see that being pictured over here. So when an insured event occurs, think about a car accident, motor accident, right? Then typically this accident will be reported to the insurance company after a certain uh, amount of delay. And with this delay, I mean, how much time do you need in order to file this, uh, this claim uh, to your insurance company in order to get uh, all this information that the insurance company needs to know about what happened, how much time do you need to, to get it uh, there. And this delay can be very short for certain types of, of, of products and for certain policyholders, but it can also be very long 
for other types of uh, products. Uh, think about liability claims or perhaps a workers' compensation uh, product where the delay can be very long in reporting because the policyholder is not immediately aware of um, the damage that he or she uh, incurred, for example, right? So this reporting delay is an important component here. And then what the insurance company is going to do is the company will, will pay for the claim, will pay for the loss with a couple of payments or a couple of loss installments, right? Until the claim eventually settles or closes, right? So what we need to do as an insurance company is we need to make sure also for those claims which are ongoing at the present moment, which are not finished yet, we need to make sure to have enough capital aside in order to pay our future, pay our, um, in order to be able to pay to compensate our policyholders uh, for their future um, loss installments related to those claims that happened in the past. Yeah? And that's what the reserving task is all about. And here again, you see that it really matters to be able to build uh, predictive models, again, for yeah, how many payments are going to happen, how much time do we need until the claim finally settles, and also the size of, of events. So when we need to do a, a loss payment, how much how big is this payment going to be? How much money do we need to settle a particular claim? We need to be able to predict these things because eventually, if we do this over all portfolios and across all uh, open claims in our books, then we get the technical provision. And that's a very important um, element on the balance sheet of an insurance company at the liability side. Yeah? So we need to be able to get a good grip on uh, what this number for the technical provision, what it should become. So that's the second task where uh, the kind of models are relevant that we're going to discuss uh, in this course and in the non-life insurance uh, course. Then I uh, brought two additional examples, but they're not immediately related to, to non-life insurance. Hmm? They're rather related, uh, well, the first one is rather related to the life insurance business and the pension uh, fund industry and social security, etc. So what you see over here is a picture with the log of the mortality rates for Belgian uh, males. So the log of the mortality rates, you see the actuarial notation over here, that's the log of the QX. And QX is the one year probability of dying for an X year old. So that means what's the probability that an X year old, a Belgian male X year old, will die before reaching age X plus one, right? So we call these probabilities, we call these mortality rates and monitoring their evolution over time and across ages is very important if you want to be able to say something about, for example, the life expectancy of, uh, of an X year old in, in, in Belgium and in a, certain, in a certain year, right? And what I did here is uh, I built a visual and I hope this time it's uh, actually working. And we're going to plot, plot here the logarithm of these Qx's over ages x, um, here on the x-axis. And we're going to do that for every year that I collected here in my, in my data set. So I'm going to start, I thought I was starting in 1950, voila. So I'm going to start here. And if I let the animation run, then you see that each line adds one year of data, and you see clear evolution in these log mortality rates over time. I finished here in 2015 because I should actually update my, my visual. Uh, I've, I've built this a, a while ago. Uh, but what you saw is the clear evolution and mortality rates going down. So that means that on average, people tend to, to live longer. Uh, and you also see the clear pattern about how these mortality rates, uh, how they change across ages. You see infant mortality here. You see uh, something around the age of 20 that we call the, the accident hump. Huh? So where you see a local increase, a local hump in these uh, mortality rates, especially for, for males. And then of course here you see the aging process with uh, mortality rates becoming, um, with mortality rates growing. Huh? Over um, ages, uh, over uh, over the age of my uh, individual, yeah. 
So why do I mention that here? Because of course, building a model to predict the future evolution of these mortality rates over time, that's very relevant in a life insurance context. Yeah, so that rather relies on time series modeling techniques and, and some time series uh, specifications and, and, and regression type of models that have been proposed to capture the evolutions in these uh, log mortality rates. But it's important to, uh, but I want to mention it here eh, as yet another example of um, an actuarial modeling task where predictive modeling becomes uh, relevant. Yeah. And the last uh, example that I have is a, is a recent project here by myself with some, some colleagues from um, the group in uh, information science uh, from the University of Leuven, where we built um, a prediction model to detect uh, fraudulent insurance uh, claims and where we used uh, information from network data. So the, the, the way how policyholders and claims and garages and, and experts, the way how they are connected uh, to each other and the way how information can propagate through this uh, network. Yeah. So this is another example of, of where these type of models that we, that we try to build uh, in this course and in the non-life insurance course where this becomes um, relevant. And here it's all about creating in an inventive uh, way, uh, extra features, in this case, features from the network data, uh, so that you can uh, use this information uh, in order to build, in this case, a supervised uh, learning mo model that helps you to detect or to flag uh, potentially fraudulent uh, claims.